Howdy, Internet. My name's Doug Parker, and I'm the devil without a cause. Uh, I'm here today to talk about a cool new web component library I've been working on called Hydroactive. Um, I actually already did a video about this a little while back, uh, which you can check out if you are definitely interested in it. But uh, it was a very long video, kind of talking about a whole bunch of different ideas and processes there. And so I kind of wanted to take a step back and taking some time to sort of reevaluate and basically kind of rewrite the thing from scratch. Uh, this is still in progress right now. But uh, instead of sort of waiting for this whole process to happen and uh, rewrite and rebuild everything from scratch uh, and then make one gigantic video at the end, I wanted to kind of uh, document the process going through uh, all of this and show some of the different ideas and challenges that I'm running into, how Hydroactive tackles those and things like that and sort of allow bigger deep dives on specific topics. So what I'm going to be doing instead is having sort of a small series where I walk through different aspects of Hydroactive. Uh, for this video, I'm probably going to start with just sort of uh, walking through the general overview of what Hydroactive is trying to do, what problems it's solving, how it tackles those in a unique and different way, uh, as well as sort of showing some of the uh, early examples of, uh, you know, Hello World, how to handle reactivity, um, things like that. So I have a little bit of code near the end, um, but I'm uh, going to try and keep this video relatively scoped for now, and then in future videos we'll start expanding on a lot of these concepts. So with that, let's dive in on exactly what problems Hydroactive is actually trying to solve. Let's begin with a really brief overview of server-side rendering, just to make sure we're all on the same page of the background and context. Essentially, when a user's device tries to request some web page, it'll ask the server, hey, give me this web page. And uh, there's a few different ways this can work, but a lot of modern JS frameworks will use an approach whereby the server responds with some kind of empty my app tag. And then the framework would load and bootstrap on the client, render that whole page out uh, on the client via client-side rendering. Instead, the alternative approach is to do this on the server with server-side rendering. Uh, this means that the application gets rendered to its full content on the server, and then the entire HTML page is sent to the client. This delivers the page faster. It's no longer dependent on client-side JavaScript, doesn't need a large framework or anything like that to display the initial page. So there's a lot of performance benefits to this. And once the page gets rendered, it'll often go through a kind of hydration process, whereby essentially the client sort of reconciles and restores any state or data that was handled by the server. Uh, this way the client can sort of pick up where the server left off without losing anything. And as the user interacts with the page, it can handle that appropriately. Now, server-side rendering doesn't specifically need to be done at request time. You can do this at build time or deploy time, but uh, to the browser, it can't really tell the difference between those two things. So for this video, we can kind of just think about this as server-side rendering. That's what I'm going to call it. Now, this is not a new idea. Uh, we've been server-side rendering the web for as long as we've had a web to server-side render. Uh, and so let's take a kind of a deeper look at how applications in the past have historically architected this kind of approach. So back in the day, we would typically write our a server-side rendering and client-side rendering logic is completely independent of each other. Essentially, we'd have the server written in some server-specific language, such as PHP or Java or C++, what have you. That'd be deployed to the server on its own. But then separately, we'd have an independent JavaScript files, uh, which would implement any client-side functionality that gets applied after server-side rendering. Maybe it's using jQuery or some other uh, libraries to make that easier, but they're pretty independent between server-side rendering and uh, your JavaScript client. The problem is that you almost have to rewrite your app twice. You need to write it once for the initial server-side rendering pass, and then again to handle client-side interactivity. Now, this largely depends on your actual use case as to how viable this is. Uh, if you have, you know, a mostly static web page and then just a few little bits and pieces change over time, then maybe that's fine. You can get away with that pretty easily. Certainly, some devs still do this today. It's entirely a, a viable approach. Nothing here is broken or, or necessarily changed. A lot of it just depends on the use case that you're really trying to create. However, a lot of modern JavaScript frameworks kind of approach this through a different architecture that I'm going to call hybrid rendering. Uh, I don't know if this really has a specific term for it. Uh, essentially, what they do is they start with having one piece of sort of application source code that you author as a developer. And you write this once, and then the framework's tooling will actually generate sort of a client-side JavaScript bundle, which gets shipped to the client. But then it also generates a separate server-side rendered build that gets shipped to the server. So you only write your code once in this one sort of uh, framework-specific format. And then the framework sort of generates these two different deployment targets for you. And this is a really powerful architecture, and it makes sense in a lot of cases, right? The framework can handle a lot of these sort of... Uh, a lot of the compatibility problems that come with this and, and making sure that the client and server stay in sync together. Um, so this is really, a, it's a powerful trick uh, that can be used to great effect, especially in highly dynamic applications. 
What's confusing to me is that sort of everybody seems to be going with this approach. Um, it seems like the thing that basically every major framework does. And yet the way that the client and server work uh, are actually very unique and distinct from each other. And so it doesn't always necessarily make sense to build them in this kind of manner. So let, let me dive into some of the challenges of this approach and, and why I think we don't necessarily always want to be going with a hybrid rendering design. So let's break down what the client and the server actually need to do and what kind of context they're operating in. Firstly, where's the data coming from? Uh, it's kind of unique that on the client, most input is actually coming from user interactions, whether that's scrolling the page or tapping a button, um, just navigating around, and just sort of the user's interactions on the device are the things that dictate what the page should be doing at any given time, and that's where its inputs are coming from. They're events that are directly triggered by the user. Meanwhile, on the server, in a server-side rendering context, it gets everything it needs from an input HTTP request. It takes that, does everything it needs to do, and responds from it. And so all of that input is sort of consolidated into a single request. It doesn't have the concept of events or, or mutations over time. Not to mention the outputs are different. In, in a real web page, the page evolves over time. Things change. They move around. Uh, the user navigates around to different sort of subpages within this. Um, they are, are clicking buttons, adding items to a list, deleting items, things like that. All of this sort of evolves and operates on the document object model directly. Meanwhile, on the server, it actually works on HTML. It, it returns HTML, which is subtly different from the, the DOM in unique ways. Uh, as one example, the way that declarative shadow DOM works in HTML is actually quite different from the way that sort of uh, native Shadow DOM works inside of the document object model. And so there are differences that are meaningful here in the way that rendering works. Not to mention on the client, it's very stateful and reactive. It's responding to the user. It's keeping information about what the user is currently doing. Uh, Server-side rendering, by contrast, is very much a stateless system. Uh, HTTP is designed to be stateless. And maybe it's access, accessing a database in the background or something like that. But fundamentally, you know, you're getting in a request, you're returning a response. This is very static. You can't change that response after you've sent it. Um, so that the sort of the context is very different in what you're trying to render. Beyond that, just the life cycle is different. A, a page on the browser can actually be quite long lived, whether that's even a few seconds or a few minutes of what you're actually looking at, or even something a little bit beyond that of like a progressive web app or a service worker where it, a page could exist for days or weeks. Um, so the, these pages kind of exist in a longer context. However, a server is just trying to respond with some whatever your server-side rendering request is. And so that should be milliseconds at a time. Like you can't let that be too slow. And so the, the life cycle of a server-side rendering request is extremely short in comparison to how long the, the user is actually going to be interacting with a client page. Not to mention just even the scale and scope of these are completely different. In the browser, you sort of have every user has their own browser, their own page that they're looking at. So if you have 100 users, they all get their own copy of the application that they're looking at. And so each version of that application only needs to worry about satisfying one user and meeting their needs. Meanwhile, a server needs to respond to hundreds or thousands of responses at any given time. And so it's inherently the sort of multi-user process that it needs to deal with. And so the challenge with hybrid rendering is that it tries to, to define a single offering format that works for both of these models. And that could be quite challenging because you're sort of forcing both sets of requirements onto the same piece of code. Uh, you need to be able to, to author this code to work in both environments, and it needs to satisfy both of those expectations. And what that means is that it's really hard to write a piece of code with any kind of understanding or assumptions that are being made about the, the kind of job it's trying to do. It can't assume how many people are interacting with the system. It can't assume how long it's going to live. It can't assume how stateful it's going to be because it needs to support both of these systems where they have competing answers to those questions. And that makes it really challenging to find the right balance. So let's dive into maybe some of the concrete challenges that these conflicting requirements can place on a hybrid application. Firstly, your components need to be authored with this in mind. They need to be compatible with hybrid rendering. It needs to be possible for the framework to create a client build and a server build of the same system. And this places certain constraints on how you can author code. Uh, you can't have direct dependencies on the window object or directly access the file system because those only exist in one environment but not the other. And you have to you know, jump through certain hoops and tricks in order to do things that only happen on one side or the other. 
Not to mention the client and the server infrastructure are inherently coupled together. You need to be using the same framework on both of these systems in order to manage some of those discrepancies that come from it. Not to mention that this coupling actually kind of leads to even more requirements on the server where you likely need to have JavaScript on your server build because you have a framework that needs to be able to work in both of these and it has to be running JavaScript. Um, you may not want that. You may want to be using a different language on the server, but that's just not very easy to do in these kinds of systems, which, where the decision you make on the front end framework actually necessitates certain decisions on your server as well, uh, which is just kind of, it's very uh, large overhead for something that really shouldn't be impacted by that decision. Not to mention, uh, a lot of frameworks kind of have to do hydration in a very specific way to support this kind of dual format that they need to deploy to. Uh, so the way this works is in hydration, often they will render a tag inside your HTML that just has sort of adjacent serialized version of your props that are, you're using. And then they will re-render your entire page on the client and then try to sort of join things up. And there's ways to do this that are maybe more put more or less constraints on things, but it sort of ends up in a situation where all of your data needs to be serializable into here in a way that's not very intuitive. You're kind of duplicating this information that was already in the HTML that you pre-rendered, but now you have to duplicate it into the JSON that's on the other side. And as a result of this, it's, it's sort of duplicating a lot of this effort that doesn't feel like it really needs to be duplicated. Not to mention many components will need to render on the client just for the sake of the framework to understand what's going on. Uh, if you have, say, like a header at the top that gets rendered once in the in server side rendering and then never really changes because there's nothing interactive with it, uh, a lot of frameworks will still have to render it on the client. And just for the sake of like making sure that things line up, making sure that uh, hydration is working as expected, only to then not do anything with it because the header doesn't change. And that just always felt very unnecessary to me. It feels like it should be possible to recognize that this component isn't changing and that we don't need to be doing anything with it. It doesn't need to be interactive. And why, do, why are we bothering to ship the, the bytes of JavaScript that are necessary to re-render this header if we're just going to re-render it once and do nothing with it? So these are kind of all different, uh, all different concerns that I've seen that sort of uh, make me question whether or not hybrid rendering is really the ideal approach to be using in all applications. So instead, what if we went back to that original approach where we sort of have the client and the server authored completely independent of each other, deployed independently and with no sort of intrinsic coupling together? This solves a lot of those previous problems I talked about with hybrid rendering. You don't have to deal with all of that complexity. But we sort of go back to the original problem, which is that we need to write our app twice, right? Uh, how do we manage these two systems that should be independent of each other, but also kind of need to interoperate in a very unique way? Well, I, the main thing I really want to get across is that I don't think we need to write our app twice. I think there are absolutely ways that we can support this without putting undue burden on developers to be able to manage the, the trade-offs in this complexity. Instead, what we need to do is think critically about how and when certain elements get rendered and how we can get the client to properly build on top of the server that already did a lot of the key work. So let's take this example where we have a small counter component which displays the current count and it has an increment button. When that button is clicked, it should increment the number. Now the server needs to server side render this because the whole component needs to be available on initial load, so the server can't really avoid that. It needs to be doing a lot of the work here. But I would ask you, what exactly does the client actually need to do here? What, what is the work it's really trying to do with this component? And it's not as much as you might think. Firstly, it needs to listen to this increment button and see that anytime that button is clicked, it increments the counter in the span tag. And that's kind of it. That's all the component needs to do. Uh, it doesn't need any kind of side channel about what the initial state of this counter is. It should already know the initial count was five, and by incrementing it, we move it to six. Uh, it doesn't need to re-render everything else. In fact, you'll notice that the entire rest of this component is completely static. It never changes. The button doesn't change. The div tag doesn't change. Everything is static. The only thing that gets adjusted is incrementing from five to six. This means that we don't need this component to have full understanding of how to render itself. The server did that work. Let's rely on the server to do that. The client doesn't need to repeat this, doesn't even need to know how to do it. Why would I need to write my app again to be able to re-render this counter from scratch? Why would I want to waste bytes of JavaScript that the user has to download to re-render a counter that's never going to get re-rendered? Uh, we only need to change one thing on this counter, so let's let's focus on writing code that actually supports that and doesn't waste a whole lot of time and energy trying to, to re-render this thing from scratch that's never going to get re-rendered. So here I'd like to sort of reintroduce Hydroactive and what it's trying to do here. 
our main goal is to let the server do the heavy lifting, right? It did server-side rendering. It did all the major work that needs to be done. Hydroactive can come in after this, and it can make it really easy to re-render only the specific parts of a page that we actually need to do on the client. This should make it really easy to take pre-rendered HTML, hydrate that HTML, and add interactivity to it. This avoids having to sort of rebuild the application twice. It avoids having to cross compile into different contexts. Uh, and I think it could be a really powerful pattern for making primarily server-side rendered apps very interactive and responsive to users. So I want to walk through some design principles for how Hydroactive is approaching the specific problem space and what it's doing um, to approach this particular challenge. So first, we want to let the server do most of the rendering. Right. This is necessary for improved page load, doesn't rely on JavaScript, just a better user experience, and that's what we want to do. However, we don't necessarily want to reinvent that. We don't want, a, we don't want this uh, hydroactive client-side system to have to re-render everything from scratch. It's bad for performance. It's just unnecessary work. That's kind of the whole premise of hydroactive is that we don't want to do that. So let's let the server do the main work. Secondly, hydroactive comes in to progressively enhance this pre-rendered HTML, something that should provide a, a good experience when you're just first uh, loading it and interacting with it before JavaScript is loaded. And once JavaScript has loaded on the page, that's where Hydroactive kicks in, makes it more available and interactive, and provides those experiences that were missing beforehand. Third, we I don't want to have any kind of required server-side integration. Kind of sort of along the lines of uh, not cross-compiling a, a client and a server build for Hydroactive. I also want to make sure that uh, we don't necessarily have these kind of weird side channels or or hooks and integrations with specific servers that enable this to work. Should be an entirely client-only solution that works on any pre-rendered HTML using any server. If you want to write your server in Fortran, you go ahead, you do what you want to do. I'm not going to work for you, but you know, if you want to do that, you are free to do it. And with that Fortran server, you should be able to render HTML, which Hydroactive can kick in and do everything you want to do with it. So should be an independent process uh, from your server. Next, Hydroactive uh, should be interoperable with web components. The idea here is that uh, Hydroactive doesn't necessarily expect that every component on the page is going to be implemented with Hydroactive. Maybe you're pulling in libraries from some other uh, web component system. Maybe you're using, uh, maybe you're trying to interoperate with other frameworks. That's fine, right? You should be able to do that. And Hydroactive should be straightforward enough to be used sort of in specific components where it makes sense to do so. If you have components on the page that are more interactive, that do require more client-side rendering, uh, they can't be effectively pre-rendered. That's fine. You should be able to put those on the same page with hydroactive components without necessarily either of those systems trying to conflict or fight with each other. Lastly, the system should be lightweight. It should be straightforward and, and worth it to be able to pull in hydroactive, use it for a single component on the page, and get the performance and optimization benefits of that while still maybe using a, a React or Angular app in your main content. Maybe you have the main content of your app is this really dynamic and rich client-side application, but maybe the header isn't. Maybe that's something that gets pre-rendered from scratch, and then you just have like a little login button on the side. That's something that you should be able to do with Hydroactive without necessarily having to completely redesign the way that your main client-side rendered app works. So this is, I think, a great way that Hydroactive can fit in in a useful way, and it needs to be lightweight enough to do that. If it's really big and complex, then you're wasting a lot of bytes on this, and it's just not worth the, the developer benefit. So we need to make sure it's lightweight enough to, to make that approach viable. As for how to get started with Hydroactive, easiest way is just npm install Hydroactive. Um, this is really just a library. There's nothing special for how you integrate with this. You can just import it as uh, you just import it as a function, call whatever you need to do within it. There's no required compiler or bundler or anything like that. You can use any system you're already using. So for the most part, you can really just think of it as a library. That's how you're going to interact with it. So I think that's enough talking about Hydroactive in a more abstract sense. So let's dive into some concrete examples and components of what the code actually looks like and how you can use it to solve real problems. So first thing we have to start with is a Hello World component. And what exactly does Hello World mean in the context of Hydroactive? Well, the server should already be doing most of the work here and it should already render the whole page. So what Hydroactive really needs to do is load onto a particular component as a part of the page and then change one specific element of it, maybe change the text on one, one specific element. And by doing that, I think that kind of describes what Hello World would look like. So in this example, we have a component which can render. It renders out Hello World initially. I've got it throttled right now just so you can see it. But once the JavaScript loads, the component bootstraps, it loads this component, it interacts, uh, reads that world, and changes it to hydroactive. 
And so this is sort of the minimal example, I think, of doing something that's trivially useful on a page. Uh, so how does this work? What does this look like? Well, with most hydroactive components, because they're kind of coupled to the way that the page actually renders a specific component, where you often want to start is just looking at the actual HTML that's getting rendered. So in this case, I have a, an HTML page that's just written statically. It's just served by a static content server. Um, and this is just the, the approach that I'm using. You could be using any arbitrarily complicated server-side rendering approach. Hydroactive doesn't care. It's a completely different thing. Uh, but just for simplicity, I'm trying to keep this uh, as low level as I can. So this is just an HTML file that's getting served. And so the, the important part here is this hello world component. And this component contains the content that we have. It's just kind of labeled hello world, just as the title of this particular test case. And then it has some HTML here. So it says hello world. And then in this case, I've put that world inside a span, which has a name uh, ID on it. And so that's the thing that we want to change. And so I'm going to use this span to alter that. Uh, the last little piece is that we have a script tag. And the script tag is the thing that loads the uh, the Hello World component onto the page. Now I'm using native uh, ES modules for this, but again, you could be using any kind of bundler or system, however you want to get this JavaScript on the page. doesn't really matter. This is just the approach side. Now, what does the JavaScript actually look like? So uh, I'm going to walk through this line by line. This is roughly what a component looks like and uh, kind of talk through and hopefully explain what each piece, uh, each piece of this is doing. So we start with importing, where we're just importing the symbols we need from Hydroactive. Uh, the main thing we really want is define component. That's kind of the entry point for what a Hydroactive component is going to look like. And so we call this to create a new component. Uh, we need to pass in the tag name that we're going to use. So in this case, we're saying hello world. This tag name needs to match what was rendered in the HTML, what sort of the wrapper element we were using. So in this case, uh, we were using hello world here. Uh, that's the thing that we're going to use. This is what allows Hydroactive to uh, bootstrap a new component for each instance of this tag on the page. And if you're familiar with uh, web components, this define component is actually calling custom elements.define under the hood. That's how this uh, gets loaded. So if you're familiar with web components, it works exactly the same way. If not, the main thing you want to ensure is that this string matches the tag name of whatever component you're trying to you're trying to manipulate on the page. The next thing is that we get a function here. Uh, this is can sort of be thought of as like the hydrate function. It essentially runs once per component instance, uh, and it happens sort of when that component gets loaded or uh, uh, sort of connected to the page is really when this tends to happen. Timing's a bit more nuanced than that, but that's a topic for a future video. So for now, we can just think of it as when the component first gets, uh, first gets connected to the document. And this particular function takes in a com comp variable and comp being short for components. I'm not 100% on the naming for this. I might change that later, but for now I'm going to go with component. Uh, but essentially this sort of provides a bunch of nice utilities for how we can interact with this component and how we can make things happen. So we start off with calling comp.live and this does a few different things for us, which I'm going to break down in a bit. But uh, essentially what this is doing is it's querying underneath this particular element and it's looking for hash name, right? It's doing query selector. so the select the element with the ID name is what it's looking for. And uh, it's trying to find this span tag. And then it's going to read that element's text content, essentially just calling dot text content on the result, and then interprets that result as a string. Um, there's more complex serializers we can do. Again, topic for a future video. Uh, but essentially what we're saying is just treat that as a string. Just give me back that value. So it'll call text content, give us back uh, this result, and it will wrap that inside a signal. Um, which is what this name is. We get a name is a signal of a string. And signals are a, a bigger topic, as I keep reiterating, though I'm going to have to go into more detail on these specifics later. Uh, for now, what we can think of a signal is just kind of as a loose getter and setter. So I can call either a uh, name with parentheses, and that'll just give me the value of whatever the, the uh, current, whatever that initial value of the span tag was. Or, as I'm doing right below, I can call name.set. And I can update this value and say change name to be hydroactive. And this has the effect of updating what the name is in JavaScript. So if I call name afterwards, I'm going to get uh, hydroactive here. Um, but also that means that, that uh, by setting it here, this actually reflects this down into the document. So the way that it knows that this is tied to hash name. And so it will update that span tag anytime we call name.set. And so this is all we need to do in order to get this component to update the, the page correctly. 
Um, so we're just using comp.live to create this kind of binding and then setting it to the new value that we want. Note that we don't have any kind of render step. We don't. We didn't need to replicate the uh, the div around it. We didn't need to replicate the h the header that said hello world. Uh, none of that is important here. We're just grabbing that one little element we care about and changing it to something else. The last piece is just if you're using TypeScript, uh, you likely want to do this declare global and then append a new uh, instance or new interface to the HTML element tag name map. Uh, this sort of this essentially tells TypeScript that if you ever see an element with the, the tag name hello world, that's actually an instance of this hello world component that I've defined. And so that's useful for improved type inference, uh, just kind of the general rule for defining uh, custom web components, you probably want to be doing this. Um, if you're not using TypeScript and just JavaScript, then you could just ignore this and not care about it. But it's a good habit to get into if you're writing TypeScript. And Hydroactive is definitely TypeScript first for sure. So uh, it's just a general best practice to consider. So with that, we have a component which is able to pre render initially and then change that text value when it loads. Uh, and so we've got our kind of hello world example of Hydroactive. So let's take a look at some slightly more complex examples being counters. Uh, so if, take this page, for example, where we've got a number of different counters. These are different examples. Let's just focus on the first one for right now, uh, which is a counter that automatically increments. Every second, this value goes up. Now, this should be rendered initially, right? It starts as 5, and that should be the initial value, and it should continue counting from there. Whatever the server put there, whether it's 5 or 10 or 100, that should be the initial value that we're using, and then it should continue to increment. So how can we implement this? Well, let's look at the code for this. Um, it's good to start with the HTML, so let's jump over to that real quick. Uh, we can bring this in. So here I've got an auto counter HTML that contains everything we need, just kind of a header to explain which, uh, which test case this is, and it renders out the current count is five. Okay, that's what the server is giving us, that's what we're starting with on the client. And so then finally at the end, we're just loading the component that's actually going to execute this. So this is what auto counter is working with when it starts. Now let's look at the actual implementation. So we're importing defined component just like we did before. General structure of this is all the same. Uh, note that we're now using auto counter because that's the new tag name that we're defining here. And we get the, uh, the hydration function. Now we're going to do something very similar. We're going to use comp.live in order to create this kind of binding with the span tag. In this case, I'm just using the tag name here, so I didn't bother with an ID, um, but essentially just using this to, to identify the span tag underneath uh, the auto counter and binding to it. The one difference we are doing is that we're using number instead of string. And this is where we start getting a little bit more value out of serializers, uh, where essentially it's able to automatically parse and to string a number field. So this count is automatically interpreted as a signal of number. It gets parsed correctly and, and gets handled uh, exactly the way you expect. So because of that, we don't need to worry about doing calling parsint or passing through the number constructor. We just already have what we're looking for. The next thing we can do is we can sort of apply any kind of side effect we want to do. Note that this hydration function always gets called once per component instance. There's really not much constraints on what you want to do there. Um, hydration is inherently a side effectful operation. So if you want to do side effects in here, you're more than welcome to do it. Uh, we did that previously by setting the name to hydroactive uh, in the previous component. And now we're going to do it by creating a timer. We're going to use set interval to create a function which gets called every second. And that is sufficient. That's really all we need to do. Uh, this is sufficient to be able to render this counter, which has clearly been ticking while I've been talking. And it works just exactly the way you would expect. One challenge with this is that uh, if you're a seasoned JavaScript developer, you might be asking, where does this interval get cleared, right? Uh, this component should be removed at some point. And so this is kind of what I'm talking about down below, where I'm saying that this function that we're in is hydrate, so it's called once per component instance. Uh, but that means that we don't do anything else. There's no other lifecycle here that's hooking into this that would clear this timer. And because of this, uh, when the component is ever disconnected or removed from the document, maybe I no longer want this component, uh, this timer would continue to tick. And in fact, this would be a memory leak. The component would never be able to be garbage collected because this interval is continually ticking. It's continually updating the span every single time. And that just gets, you know, that's bad, right? We don't want uh, memory leaks in our code. So the better way of doing this, uh, better example here is to do what we have down here. So this uses a new API called comp.connected. This sort of creates some lifecycle hooks for here. And really it's 
what it's doing is it invokes this function anytime the component is connected to the document. So when it's first hydrated and first connected, this will run once. If I were to remove this element and then re-add it back to the document, because maybe moving it around, uh, this would be invoked again. And so every time it gets connected, this gets re-invoked. And this is an opportunity where when this component is connected, we're able to call this timer, right? We can create our set timeout or set interval and then update the count every time we do it. But this now gives us an opportunity to clean it up. So I can create a handle reference that I, I keep around and I can return a new function which gets invoked on disconnect. So whenever this component gets disconnected from the DOM, this function will be executed. And in doing so, I can now clear this interval and stop the timer. That means that anytime the component's connected, it'll start the timer. When I remove it, it stops. If I re-add it, it'll restart itself and works exactly how the user would expect. But also if I disconnect it and then just throw it away because I'm not using it anymore, it's eligible to be garbage collected. It'll clean itself up. There's no memory leak, nothing like that. And so that's essentially how uh, the improved way of doing this would be. And so instead, we're sort of taking a slightly different approach here um, and being, making it easy to hook into the lifecycle methods of components. And I really like the way that scoping works here, where because I'm able to sort of have uh, do whatever initialization work I want to do, and then I sort of close that over with a, a new disconnect handler, which I think makes scoping really easy. And so you don't have to like save this into a, a private variable or something like that that's sometimes initialized, sometimes not. It, it gets kind of complicated and, and scoping gets weird. So I really like the, the API here for this kind of approach. One other thing I'd like to point out is that the uh, there is no initial value specified here. Because I said comp.live span number, it will read the initial value from whatever the span happens to start with. So in this case, we start with 5, right? That's dictated by the server. The server chose what that 5 was. And hydroactive will pick up from that value. Count will initially be 5. Uh, and so because of this, you don't have to hard code that value. There's no special side channel where you need to pass JSON or anything like that. It just picks up this value from the natural place where it should be. And that's sort of the, the great advantage of uh, the way that these serializers work. And so that means when we do things down here around like, you know, increment this value and update it, uh, this just naturally works in a way that preserves the state that was done from the, the server, which I think is super cool and, and really powerful and intuitive way of working with these kinds of components. Next, let's take a look at the second counter here, the bind counter. Now you'll notice that this works basically the same way. It has a, it starts at 10 to a slightly different initial value, but it also increments every second. My point with this component is to try to break down maybe a little bit more of what comp.live is doing, because live is a very powerful API, uh, but there's a lot more underneath it that I think can, can provide a lot more flexibility. So let's take a look at that approach. So here we have a new component called bind counter. Um, again, we're using the same structure of just using define component with a, a callback function. Now it's going to use some slightly different APIs. It specifically does not use comp.live. It's using different APIs to achieve the same result. And so the first thing that we do here is we use comp.host. This gives us a reference to the host element. So specifically, if I look at the HTML, uh, right, we've got bind counter, which has the exact same structure, but it's starting with 10. Uh, the host element is this right here, this bind counter element. That's the thing that, that is the host element. And so comp.host gives us a reference to that. But it's not just the HTML element. It actually gives us a, a element ref. Uh, it's kind of a wrapper API around this. And so you can kind of think of this maybe like jQuery. jQuery would kind of box uh, objects into its own little thing. Um, and so this is something similar where it's kind of trying to present a little bit smoother API surface for what developers would often want to be doing in this kind of hydration context. And so essentially with this element reference, we've got some nicer APIs here. And what we're going to do is call dot query. And query is doing exactly what you would probably think it's doing. It's invoking query selector uh, for the selector that's given, but it's adding a couple uh, niceties to it. It asserts that the result is always defined. Right, if you if you get null as the response, it'll throw an error and that will uh, just stop it because usually you expect the element to exist, so you don't need to go out of your way to assert it. Um, another thing is that it will automatically implicitly type the result based on the selector, which I think is super cool. Um, so here I have explicit types just to be clear about what's happening here. But if I delete this, uh, you'll actually find that this is inferred to be element ref of span element. And that is coming from this uh, selector here, the fact that I said span. Um, what's cool is this is actually a full parser, so I could do something like uh, span hash name, and it's still smart enough to parse that, and it'll still tell me that this is a span tag. 
If I change this to a div with name, that'll still work. If I do like a descendant selector, like a div that contains a UL tag, that contains an LI tag, let's say, it'll still figure that out and it'll tell me, oh, this is an HTML LI element because that's the thing that you're actually going to get from this. But I think that's super cool. I just think that's a really nice quality of life thing. You don't have to cast it, for instance, if you're going to use some specific API and that's kind of nice. Um, so I think that's really cool. But uh, let's go back to what we had before with the span tag. So this gives us a reference to the span, and this is specifically an element ref. It's, it's boxed again, right? We're getting a return value of element ref, so we're continuing to chain this particular um, object. And so this also has some other APIs onto it. Specifically, it has a read. And so I can call, I can take this label object and I can call dot read on it. And this allows me to pass in the serializer. So this is kind of the other half of uh, live. So I'm telling it, read this thing as a number, and that will essentially uh, call text content on it, uh, get that value, and then parse that into a number and give me the result. In this case, it's not a signal. I'm just getting back the number itself, and that's what we're ending up with. The next piece is that I'm going to box it into a signal. So I'm kind of directly invoking the signal uh, constructor. So something that got imported from up here. Um, so we're exposing the uh, signal implementation here for how this works. And uh, we're able to create our own signal with this initial value. So it's, it's starting with whatever we read from the server, but uh, we've got this, uh, this current count and we can change it over time. Now, if I were to, now at this point, I can call count. I can read what this value is. Initially, that'll be 10. I can also call count.set and update it to 15, whatever value I want to do. Uh, but this is kind of uh, internal to itself. This is, it doesn't affect the DOM in any way because it hasn't been structured that way. The signal doesn't know what it's, what it's coupled to in the DOM. And that's where this final step comes in. We call comp.bind. And what this does is essentially uh, kind of the, the other side of things where we sort of initialized our input based on what was already in the document. And now we want to update that document when the state changes. So in this case, I'm saying query the, uh, query the DOM for the span tag, right? This is the same thing that we had up here. And then update it to be whatever the count is. And this is using some magic and signals, which I'll have to talk to talk about in the future. Uh, but essentially, this is able to say update it to whatever the current value of count is, and if count ever changes, automatically update this value. And so this is where we're. Uh, this is sort of how we're able to reflect these changes back down into the document. Now this is all kind of verbose, right? I had to do four different lines here that are trying to do this, and it's kind of verbose for sure. Uh, but essentially, this is what comp.live does. In fact, if you look at the source code for comp.live, it is basically this. Um, so essentially, comp.live is you know supposed to be the thing that you're usually using, but these sort of smaller primitives allow you to construct things that are a little bit more complicated, right? Maybe you're trying to bind the same value in multiple places. Um, maybe you want to read a value that doesn't change, right? Maybe we read the initial count, but then that value stays in the DOM and never changes. Then maybe you would just want to query it and read it and stop there. Maybe you use that value elsewhere, but you don't want a signal around it. You don't want to bind anything. Um, so there's lots of different uh, use cases for when you would want to use specific pieces of these things, but the idea is to break down the primitives that are necessary in order to be able to do whatever is appropriate for your component. Most of the time, though, I think comp.live is usually what you want, um, but we'll have to see how people actually use this in practice. Last step at the end is exactly the same as what we had before. Right? We've got comp.connected, we create a timer, and then we increment this count uh, every time the timer invokes. And when it disconnects, we clear it to avoid the memory leak. And so this is all the same because, again, this is effectively equivalent to comp.live. So this is what allows us to create that same timer. So this is how we've got something that is able to increment every second. Works exactly the same, but just using some lower level primitives. Next example I want to talk about is showing event listeners. So in this case, we have some buttons. We have a plus and a minus. And when I click these, it is able to update the current count. Uh, so this is a little bit different. We need to be able to use an event listener. And we need to be able to register those in a way that's uh, safe for memory leaks and things like that. So how can we approach this particular component? Um, let's look over here. Uh, let's actually start with the HTML. Um, so I've got button counter here, kind of labeling what this example is. We render out the current count is 15, just giving a different initial value. Uh, but then we've got two buttons. So we have uh, decrement and increment. And these are the buttons we want to tie to the span tag. It's exactly the example I was talking about way earlier of click the button, it should update this tag. And so the way this works is that we're using comp.live to create a binding to the span tag that we can mutate over time. Um, again, usually you're going to want comp.live. So we've got a new API here called comp.listen, which is going to set up the event listeners for us. 
And in this case, we have a few different parameters here. The first one is just a selector that's going to get invoked. So this is going to call query selector, get back the, uh, the actual element that you want to add the event listener to. Uh, the next step is the event that you're listening to, in this case, just whenever the button gets clicked. And lastly, the event handler that we want to run when this button is clicked. So in this case, just saying if you click decrement, we want to subtract one from the count. And when you click increment, we want to add one to the count. And that's really the extent of it. Um, what I think is really cool about this is that because of the way that this is designed around a hydrate function, which executes exactly once, it means that we kind of record what event listeners are being loaded for a particular component. And then we're able to automatically unbind and rebind those listeners when the component gets detached and reattached. So underneath here is actually a comp.connected call, um, which is doing uh, add event listener for you. And then returning the uh, returning a disconnect handler, which calls remove event listener. And so it's essentially doing something like that. So it's handling all of that for you, which I think is really powerful. And by doing that, it means that you don't have to worry about removing these event listeners. And I think that just makes this way simpler and way easier to work with. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to uh, you don't have to call like function.bind on this in order to set the, this value for it. Uh, you don't need to get a stable reference that gets added and removed. Um, otherwise, you can't use lambdas. Like you really just can't use a lambda function in add event listener because otherwise you'd never be able to remove it. But the way that this works, you can absolutely do that. You use the lambda, it works exactly the way that you expect. And I think that's just really ergonomic and powerful and I'm super happy with the way that this turns out. The last real quick example I'll go through is for attributes. Uh, so we'll flip over to this. And so let's look at the HTML. So in this case, it's just displaying hello devil, but what was the HTML that it started with? So here, what we've done is we've rendered out uh, some HTML, but then I've got an ID in here, which says like, this is the user that is representing this component, it has some ID. Maybe the server doesn't know what uh, what the user's name is, right? Maybe the that data is stored on a separate API server that only the client has access to. Maybe the user's name is stored in the browser in IndexedDB or local storage, something like that. So uh, instead, what the server might render is it would render this little like dash, like, I don't know what the name is. The name would go here, but I'm not familiar with what it is. So I'll put some placeholder here for now. And then it would send some other data that the user can't see, right? The user ID, and then we expect the client to be able to find the user for that ID and update the element accordingly. So how can we do this? Uh, well, the way that this would work is that we can get a reference. So again, this is the exact same structure. We're just using define component with a new attribute, uh, with a new tag name. And uh, we call comp.host to get a reference to that host element that has the attribute we want. Um, ultimately, we could query to look for any element. You really just need any element ref, but in this case, the attribute is on the host element. And then we call that uh, reference dot attribute. And then you can say, find whatever attribute I want, and then call, uh, use this serializer to parse what that is. So in this case, let's interpret that value as a number. So that'll read the, read the DOM, get the attribute, parse it as a number. And then we can do whatever we want with it. In this case, we're going to use uh, this get user by ID function and just figure out what the user's name is. Uh, and if you look at that, it's really, it's kind of just, oh, if it's one, two, three, four, it's devil. Otherwise, I don't know who it is. Um, this could be, you know, this is a mock. You could look at IndexedDB. You could make an network request to some server, whatever you want to do here. But for demonstration purposes, you know, the client knows what the name is and they can resolve that. So based on this, we're able to get the current username, and then we use comp.bind to bind this back down and say, that's the value that it should be. You should update this. In this case, it's just a constant and it'll never change, uh, but this could be a signal. This could mutate over time if the user edits a form field, however you want to approach that. So here, you know, this may be a better example of how we're able to break down a specific piece. So comp.live wouldn't quite work here because the dash is not really a user's name. So reading that initial value doesn't make sense. Uh, but in terms of, you know, using um, an element ref to read a separate attribute and then using this to update some existing state. That's where we're able to break down a little bit and, and use these primitives in an effective way. So I think that's enough for one video. I'm going to call it here. Um, I have more examples, more content uh, that I would definitely love to share. And so what my plan is, is that I'll probably be doing more uh, shorter recurring videos. This one's probably going to be on the longer side, but hopefully in the future, it'll start to get shorter if I can hold myself to that. Uh, we'll see how that actually works out in practice.
Uh, but essentially, sort of as I'm working through different aspects of Hydroactive, I want to be able to create uh, more videos talking about these specific aspects. Um, probably the next step is going to be talking about signals and reactivity, what that means for Hydroactive. Uh, I've been debating between different uh, authoring formats, whether or not I want to keep going with this kind of functional approach that I've shown here. Uh, There's actually another alternative approach based on classes that maybe makes more sense. I don't know. I'm still trying to make that decision. Uh, so it's going to be lots of interesting content for Hydroactive. Uh, if you're interested in that, if you think this is cool, leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear what you think about this, uh, whether or not this is an interesting idea, whether or not the this is a problem that you've seen that you'd like to see fixed, whether or not you think Hydroactive effectively solves that problem, or what kind of changes you'd like to see in it, what kind of features would be useful for that. And of course, subscribe for immediate notification for any new videos if uh, this is something you want to keep an eye on going forward. Uh, I think it's going to be lots of cool stuff coming and so definitely something that you want to keep an eye out for if you're interested in this kind of thing so with that thanks for watching really appreciate you taking the time to uh, hear me talk about all these kind of crazy weird ideas and uh, looking forward to developing more on hydroactive and sharing more with the community so see you next time